So I want to tell you about um, our Iger, you know, more from the perspective of people who were developing it, the faculty and the administrators. But right after this, we're going to have uh, presentations by student, two students from each of our three cohorts, and you'll get more of the on-the-ground experience and details. And we do want to be speaking about the rewards and the challenges of these programs. But I want to go through it with you from somewhat of a historic uh, perspective of, of getting started. And uh, you'll hear a little bit about the mosquitoes, the mice, and the corn as, as we move on. So what I want to say is, you know, like what was the impetus for us getting together? And I, I want to start here, this beautiful picture of Agrobacterium gall on a four-year-old uh, alfalfa plant. In the 1970s, people figured out that this bacteria was inserting genes into the plant to serve its own purposes. And somebody had this great idea that, gee, maybe we could usurp this natural process and get these genes into the plant to serve humans' needs or something like that. And, you know, in a way, that sounded bizarre, right, that you're going to, you know, convert this plant. Well, that idea in the 70s translated to a lot of possibilities and products, one of which was taking a gene out of a bacterium that was used by organic farmers to put this bacteria to kill caterpillars and moving that gene into corn plants, which resulted in protection from insect pests. So that led to some people being incredibly excited and thinking that we could use these, this technology to feed the world. It wasn't quite so simple. It also led some people to think the opposite, right? And this led to a lot of discussion, societal interactions, and so on. And it sort of led to this, where you wound up with people sort of identifying, almost as if they were identifying with baseball teams or political parties, you know, and this kind of uh, polarization where the middle ground was losing. In around the 1990s, entomologists, in which I identify, um, realized that, well, we couldn't use agrobacterium, that's just for plants, but there were an other element, a piggyback element, could be used to genetically engineer insects. Okay, and here's just an example of that white eye as a mutant to which they added a new gene that made the eye red, okay, an external gene. And, you know, this brought up ideas in people's heads that we could transform insects, for example, from transmitting malaria parasite, the plasmodium, to not transmitting it, from taking a crop pest and, turn, and, and causing decimation of its populations through ideas of gene drive and so on. And these are great ideas, but it was sort of like if you thought back to that agrobacterium in the beginning, you know, it's fanciful, you know, could we really do anything? And, but there, this was this idea and this dream in the uh, early 21st century. And we at NC State pulled together a group thinking that we knew a lot about the ecology and population genetics of this stuff, but we needed more help on the molecular biology side. And so we thought we were going to have this integrative group that had ecology, population genetics, and molecular biology, and were able to hire two new people, Marseille Lorenzen and Max Scott, based on explaining about interdisciplinarity to our administration and, and getting this going. So we started on that, but still what we recognized was even though we were talking about something that companies probably wouldn't be interested in because this is more public investment, there weren't a lot of profits to be made and all of that, we still were in the shadow of this debate. And indeed, that started coming out. And so as we moved on, we sort of changed our model from this idea that ecology, molecular biology, and population genetics was integrative in what we needed to one that brought in policy, social issues, and ethics into our discussions and an idea that maybe we could uh, educate graduate students in that model. A lot of us hung out around Gardner Hall and Thomas Hall in this little spot on campus, but we had to, you know, walk a little bit and <laughs> get to other parts of campus. And these are the groups that started talking together 
All right. So all the way from rhetoric and communication, uh, public administration to molecular genetics. And there were a group of us who really sort of believed in that. And we asked these questions of could we, you know, from the biologists, should we? And if so, how would we do this? Right. And the main thing was, could we come up with a different way of introducing this genetic engineering of insects that would have a different model than happened with the crops and would lead to a different result with less polarization, with more understanding. And from that emerged this grant proposal, Genetic Engineering in Society, the case of transgenic pests. So we had a direction. We were interested in genetic engineering in society, but we want to focus it. We knew that the National Science Foundation would want focus, not just something general. And that's, that's what we came up with. And uh, we had, this is the co-PIs, um, entomology, anthropology, zoology, communication, mathematics, and it went beyond that. Uh, in light of the discussions uh, earlier, when we, we submitted this thing three times, it was actually six proposals. Um, but the first one, uh, Brent Faber was one of the co-PIs, and he was from English. And we found out very quickly from NSF that that wouldn't uh, fly. But we found ways that we could involve people who were in the social sciences, like people in communication, which there is a, a director at, at NSF in uh, social sciences. So these were the folks who got things started. And what we promised NSF was that if you look at, um, you know, programs beforehand, you'd see a molecular biology program, population genetics and ecology were integrative in their own sense, and policy, social issues, and ethics. If you look at the students being trained in that, each one would look like one of those black dots in its corner. Right, gaining a lot of knowledge in molecular biology, but gaining knowing nothing about ecology, and the same thing all the way around. And so what we promised NSF was this new model, that we would have graduate students trained somewhere in that bizarre little eclipsy thing um, in, the, in the middle there. And um, so each student would fit into one of those, all right? Student A may be trained in one way, but they'd all have that integrative experience. And the idea was to have those students come together. We brought students in from all those different programs and that they would um, look at a specific system and in, in uh, other parlance, you know, a, 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 a boundary object. And uh, we gave NSF a number of possibilities, but when we came down to it, we had these three uh, focus groups. The first was on mosquito vectors of human disease, and they went to Peru, and you'll hear about that for their work. The uh, mice and rats on islands was about conserving biodiversity using genetic engineering, and they went to coastal islands off the coast of California. And a third group on stored grain beetles and, and crop losses, and they went to uh, Mexico. And you'll be hearing from those students. Nuts and bolts of the program. Uh, PhD or master's in the disciplinary program. So we were, did not create a new thing except we developed a graduate minor. Okay, and these are all the different uh, PhD programs that they could be in. You could see how diverse those are. Okay, they had to take coursework. We actually developed four new courses. Um, and the important piece to show you is whether you were a student in genetics or in public administration, you went through these graduate courses. And our students can tell you that, you know, these were stretching things. And when people say that interdisciplinarity depends on the students, that's what it takes. I don't want to go into details. They may touch on those. But they also had to do other things, group projects, weekly colloquia. Uh, and I'll get to these in at least one thesis chapter in the focus area. And they had to participate in workshops and assessments, NSF kind of things. Um, and we, we had quite a bit of success, concrete successes. We established the GES Center. Uh, you'll hear from our alums what they're doing. And uh, at least two major research grants came from student projects. One, which is uh, from DARPA, which could, in, at the end, wind up with about $6 million or something like that. Another uh, RO1 from uh, NIH, which is about $1.7 million. So, I mean, these are big things that came out of student projects. And lastly, bonds uh, among the diverse faculty. And um, some of the key factors leading success, I, I want to go through this kind of quickly in terms of time, but we had people, uh, faculty from all over those areas, right? People in those different disciplines, some though contributing more than others, but 
others just being available to mentor students. But a big key was that the administration came through with a cluster hire for us. I mean, we had to write the proposal and all. They agreed to it, and this is where they hired three new faculty members in different social sciences, Jennifer Kuzma in the middle, uh, Jason and Zach. Um, and this has been really important because half of their time was assigned to be devoted to this center and these efforts. Um, and this was the whole key to this genetic engineering and society center that emerged from that integrating scientific knowledge and public values in shaping futures of biotechnology. Sorry for that slide. Uh, but Zach brought that up before. That is really our, our goal. Um, and the other, another point of success was to help the success was our weekly colloquia. Many of you who are per, even peripherally involved in the uh, IGERT attend these things. We have speakers from who are just from Monsanto or from NGOs that are diametrically opposed to any genetic engineering. And that's where Zach showed you this slide, and it's in your booklet. This statement of productive, inclusive, and ethical communication became very important. We learned that at one colloquium where was a speaker was shouted down. All right, I mean, remember what we're dealing with. And I think we learned a lot. Talk about challenges. Um, and the other part is that we do have some fun. <laughs> can you tell which of the faculty, right? <laughs> but also, you'll hear about that, but can you tell which of these folks uh, are Mexican citizens, right? Um, so I, 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 you, we had lots of challenges. Again, I don't want to go into all in detail, but you know, fitting the Geigert, Geigert students into diverse PhD programs, some of which required themselves a first year of coursework. How do you fit that in when other programs are different? So in terms of recruiting students, that was important. Uh, overloading students. Some students might talk to that. Um, and, uh, you know, faculty without long-term incentives to participate, and departments viewing us as competition or a threat. S you, uh, you couldn't imagine. We thought giving the, uh, students in a department $30,000 to just have a fellowship would be a great gift. It wasn't seen as a gift, okay? Um, you could see giving faculty members uh, payouts for courses as a gift. It wasn't seen as a gift all the time. So uh, we could talk about that. Um, and then balancing natural sciences and social sciences and humanities in terms of people's interests. In the beginning, a lot of the humanities and social scientists felt that they were just tokens. That's not the way it is now. Sometimes I think some of the faculty in the biological sciences feel like tokens. So it's a, it is a very interesting try, thing trying to balance that. I was going to go through one of the uh, faculty's great uh, thoughts on these rewards and stuff, but for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to leave it out and, and hear about our faculty. Our faculty, one faculty member, and I polled them, said, it's all really exhausting, but we keep on going because it's so exciting. And I think that's what has been keeping us going. All right, so thank you, and we'll have the students coming up.